Frequency modulation, or FM radio, changed the way we communicated. It was, according to Howard Armstrong's eventual nemesis, David Sarnoff, a revolution. I've seen books and videos and articles about this history, but they always skim over the science. This is my attempt to tell an accurate, but clear and simple description of how Howard Armstrong invented FM radio in the first place and how it was so amazing that it led to his destruction. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. In 1923, Howard Armstrong worked with his friend David Sarnoff, then the vice president of RCA, to make the Radiola radio. And soon Armstrong and Sarnoff made millions of dollars and broadcast radio took over the culture. There was only one problem, static, and it had to do with the nature of AM radio. Let's start with some basics. Radio waves aren't sound waves. I know, crazy, right? They're actually invisible light waves. Radio waves are used as the medium that is used to transmit or carry the sound information. In AM radio, sound is converted into an electrical signal, and that signal is used to change the height or the amplitude of the wave. Thus the name AM radio for amplitude modulation. However, every time there is a spark, it makes a radio wave, which increases the amplitude of the wave, which creates static in AM radio. Sarnath had repeatedly said that he wished he had a little black box to get rid of static, and Howard Armstrong thought he had the solution. Why not create a radio wave where the amount the frequency deviated from the original, more squished or stretched, corresponded to the sound wave produced in the microphone instead of changing the height? For this reason, it is called FM radio for frequency modulation. Actually, many scientists were interested in using frequency modulation in the late teens and early 20s. However, in 1922, John Carson, the head mathematical theoretician at Bell Laboratories, wrote a paper that it wouldn't work. Well, to be more accurate, he said it would work, but it inherently distorts without any compensating advantages whatsoever. Carson eventually concluded that, quote, Static, like the poor, will always be with us. Now Armstrong was even more determined, saying, quote, I could never accept findings based almost exclusively on mathematics. In 1928, Howard Armstrong decided to spend all of his time trying to make FM radio. For three years, he got nowhere. Then he had a radical idea. He knew that in order to make FM radio, you by necessity had to change the frequency. He also knew that with the technology available at the time, he needed to keep that fluctuation to a minimum or it distorted the signal, as Carson mathematically proved. But then it was impossible to have the full range of sound and to reduce static. What if, he thought, you started with a low frequency with small changes and then multiplied it to a higher frequency with large changes and made the receiver only receptive to large changes? This is called broadband FM radio, and it was not an easy task, and it took him till 1933 for him to get it right. But when he did, it worked even better than he had hoped. The static was gone. Now FM. You could transmit the whole range of human hearing instead of a small range like AM. You could even transmit two signals at the same time to make surround sound. And Sarnoff hated it. You might ask, how can a signal from a microphone be changed into variations of the frequency of the wave? Well, it's a little confusing, but Armstrong started with creating an AM signal on a very low frequency radio wave. He then suppressed the original smooth radio wave and reinstalled it 90 degrees out of phase. This creates a PM or phase modulation. So instead of the signal changing the height of the wave, 
it changes the phase of the wave or where the wave starts. He then used capacitor to smooth out or integrate the system and make it into an FM signal. Finally, he used harmonics to multiply the signal to get to the carrier frequency and frequency variations that he wanted. How about the receiver? Well, to talk about an FM receiver, let's start with how Armstrong's AM receiver worked first. With AM, Armstrong amplified a signal from an antenna and then mixed it with another signal to create a lower intermediate signal that was easier to deal with. He then filtered it to his desired frequency, amplified that signal, and then used electronics to detect the changes in amplitude. By the way, this envelope detector could be as simple as a one-way valve. Finally, he amplified the sound and projected it onto a loudspeaker. The FM receiver was only slightly different than the AM receiver. First, with FM, you don't want a narrow frequency filter or you'd cut out all your information. So he used a broad frequency filter. Second, he used something he called a limiter because it limited the height of the wave. Basically, it saturated the system so that any variation in the height of the waves was cut off since the real signal was in the variation of the frequency and the variation in the height was only due to static anyway. Third, instead of an envelope detector, Armstrong used something he called a discriminator that would, as Armstrong put it, quote, translate variations in frequency into variations in amplitude. Armstrong created two tuned circuits with coils and capacitors, one tuned to above the carrier frequency and one tuned to below the carrier frequency. If a wave was created with no modulation that would work equally badly in both circuits, then the two coils labeled 48 and 49 would get the same voltage induced in them, which would cause no current to flow between them. However, if the frequency was modulated higher or lower, then one circuit would resonate better and at a higher amplitude, and the other would resonate worse with a lower amplitude. This would cause one coil to have higher voltage induced than the other coil, which would create a current between them and correspondingly current in the speaker or headphones. The bigger the frequency difference, the bigger the amplitude of the current in the headphones. In this way, Armstrong converted changes in frequency to changes in amplitude in the speaker. Woo! So if FM was so much better than AM, why wasn't Sarnoff happy? Well, Sarnoff was hoping for something to improve his system, not something to supplant his system. What to do? Sarnoff decided to crush his friend's new invention, kicked Armstrong out of his laboratory in the Empire State Building, had his scientists write articles denigrating FM, and forbade RCA from using FM radio. Undeterred, Armstrong sold all his stock in RCA and started his own FM company called the Yankee Network. It wasn't until five years later that Sarnoff realized his mistake and tried to get Armstrong to sign a million dollars worth of a non-exclusionary license. Armstrong told Sarnoff to get lost. Armstrong's lawyer thought his client was crazy. Quote, that's the first time I ever heard of an inventor turning down a million for a non-exclusionary license. Sarnoff was incensed. He started a personal war with his former friend and used his influence to have the FCC change the radio frequencies available for FM, making Armstrong's equipment and company worthless. Sarnoff and RCA then started using FM without permission, and soon many other companies followed suit. In July of 1948, Armstrong sued. RCA decided to win by making the lawsuit as long and arduous as possible. Or as Armstrong said, quote, they will stall this thing until I'm dead or broke. And this lawsuit dragged on and on. Armstrong's deposition lasted a full year. In 1952, he ran out of money and had to have loans to pay his lawyers. On February 20th, 1953, Sarnoff lied under oath that, quote, RCA has done more to develop FM than anyone in this country, including Armstrong. Defeated, Armstrong tried to settle, but Sarnoff wouldn't let him. In November of 1953, Armstrong admitted the state of his finances to his wife, Marion. They had a horrible fight, and Armstrong hit her arm with a poker. Marion fled the house, never to see her husband again. On January 31st, 
1954, exactly 40 years after Armstrong stayed up all night with Sarnoff demonstrating his regenerative circuit, a date they celebrated for decades, Armstrong wrote his wife an apology, removed the air conditioner from his apartment window, and jumped 13 floors to his death. He was 63 years old. When David Sarnoff heard of Armstrong's suicide, he blurted, I didn't kill Armstrong, but he must have known he had a hand in Armstrong's desperate act and wept openly at his funeral. Marion Armstrong continued all of her husband's lawsuits. Eventually, she would file 21 patent lawsuits and win all of them. She won over $10 million in damages over the next 11 years. Let's go back to 1934 for a bit. Part of the reason that David Sarnoff did not want to supplant his system with FM is because he was cash poor, because he had already poured $5 million into controlling a strange item called a cathode ray tube. This is why Sarnoff and RCA eventually became the titans of CRT television. But what is the cathode ray tube? Why was it invented? And what's its connection to not only television, but also the oscilloscope, radar, x-ray machines, the discovery of the electron, and the photoelectric effect. Well, that starts next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. That was my last video on the history and physics of radio. Now I'm gonna move on to the cathode ray tube, x-rays, discovery of electron, even quantum mechanics. But don't worry, I will eventually get to the discovery of television because that's a crazy story. So why don't you subscribe and then you'll know all my new videos. Okay, have a nice day.